The Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. Pocket Cinema Camera. Try again. Uh, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera G2. Yeah, you forgot 6K. God damn it! Welcome back, DP Review TV viewers. It is Jordan Drake here to talk about the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K G2 that I've been using for a little while. Now, a few years ago, we took a look at the 4K version of this with a micro four thirds mount. In the last few years, they've done actually three versions of the 6K camera, the original 6K, the 6K Pro, and now the 6K G2. And I want to talk about how that compares to some of the more recent mirrorless competition that has come out. It's been fun shooting with this camera. I want to talk about my experiences. Today's experiment is my co-host, Chris Nichols, will be filming on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K G2 today. Uh, how are you enjoying it, Chris? Um, I'm still trying to figure it out, but it looks like a camera from the 90s and not like in a good way. So if you're familiar with the rest of the Pocket Cinema Camera lineup, how is the 6K G2 different? Well, basically the 6K G2 is a 6K Pro, but without the ND filters. What, did you forget what you were going to say? No, no, no. That's it. That's literally all I have to say about that's that. That's our video. And that's a wrap. No, you got to give okay. more detail. Okay, let's, let's get into it. Now, what really defines the 6K series of these cameras is their Super 35 6K APS-C sensor and the fact that they're all using a fairly long flange distance EF mount. Now, that made a ton of sense with the 6K Pro because that long mount there accommodated those built-in ND filters, but with this, it's just a lot of empty space in there, and this does make the body pretty bulky. This is really one of my major issues with the entire line of 6K cameras. I wish that they would move to a mirrorless mount, so then we could adapt a whole bunch of different lens types with it. Yes, there's a whole bunch of EF lenses floating around, but it's unfortunate because Canon has stopped producing new lenses in this mount. A lot of third-party companies are moving away from it. There are still some third-party lens designs being made natively in EF mount, but the writing is on the wall for this lens mount. Now the 6K Pro brought a lot of really necessary upgrades over the previous 6K model. And aside from the ND filters, those are all featured here. So we get the Sony NP500 series battery on it, which gets you much better battery life. And those are extremely affordable batteries. We get the option to put an electronic viewfinder on, $500, 3.69 million dots. It is quite a nice electronic viewfinder. We've got a tilting screen on it. This is just a much more functional camera if you want to use it as kind of a run and gun thing without having to rig it all up, which is part of the appeal of having a small camera in the first place. So you have that optional electronic viewfinder, but what about the main display? That's one of the really nice advantages of one of the pocket cameras. You've got a beautiful five inch 1080p display, really, really easy to confirm your focus. And Blackmagic's menu interface is actually really well thought out and quite intuitive. And really usefully, just like the 6K Pro, this is a tilt display, which makes it so much easier if you wanna shoot waist level, get some low angle shots. Unfortunately though, this is not a fully articulating screen. So if you're planning to use this camera to film yourself, it's not gonna be a very easy process. You're gonna need a friend like I got Chris here. And if you wanna know if it's recording or not, this does have a tally lamp, but it is unbelievably dim. I mean, you might be able to see it if you're shooting a dark, moody lit interior shot or you're shooting out at night. But in a bright day like today, I have no idea if he's recording or not. I'm recording. Hope so. I think. When you're looking at either of those displays, this is gonna give you a nice variety of assist tools. We've got focus peaking, we have false color, which is actually not that common in cameras in this price range. Really nice for me during a scene, but I do turn it off once I actually start recording the clip. It can be quite distracting. And we do have a histogram on this, but where's the waveform? This seems bizarre. That is my absolute favorite way to meter a scene and Blackmagic has it on their external monitors, obviously with their DaVinci editing software. I've always got my waveform set up. I've been complaining about this for a long time with the pocket cinema cameras. Just give us a waveform already. In terms of the type of media that you can use, this is actually a really flexible camera. You've got a standard SD card slot on this, also a CFast card, and I haven't used a camera with that in a long, long time. I know they're doing it just to keep it consistent with the rest of the Blackmagic cameras, but 
nothing uses CFast anymore. I would really like to see them move on to a CF Express type A or B that's a much more common card format these days. But also one thing I really like if you're looking for like long record times with affordable media, you can just plug an external hard drive into the USB-C port on this camera and it's just gonna see it as essentially a gigantic memory card. And then you can even edit off that hard drive once you're done shooting. It's a really cool efficient system that I wish we had on more cameras. If you look through the feature list, you're gonna see that this has autofocus in it. Quick, Chris, fix the focus, autofocus engage. Okay, so it did hit, uh, but what you probably notice there is it's kind of a weird system. First of all, your subject has to be in the exact center of the frame. There's no way to move the autofocus area on this, but on top of that, it's a contrast detect system. So it has to focus in front and behind your subject and then hit the midpoint. What that basically means is you're gonna have to throw away any footage when the camera is actually autofocusing. I mean, it can be nice in a pinch if you completely lose your focus, but most of the time I would just stick to manual focus with this thing. Okay, there's a lot of inconveniences when you're working with the pocket cinema camera lineup, but so many videographers and cinematographers are willing to overlook that because of the record options. So with this camera, you can record ProRes in three flavors. You can do HQ, 422, LT, and these are beautiful files that are gonna be editable on any editing system out there. However, if you are a Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve user, then you have access to the B-RAW, and this is what really sets this camera apart from anything else in the price range. So generally, if you want compressed RAW video, you're looking at an external recorder like an Atomos Ninja or a Blackmagic Video Assist, or you gotta pony up and buy a RED, or, or potentially get a Nikon Z9. We'll see how that lawsuit with RED susses out. But this is a huge advantage for the camera. It gives you tons of flexibility, and B-RAW is very easy to edit on most modern computer systems, and the file sizes are quite small. You can shoot RAW video to an SD card, which is really impressive. I really love that Blackmagic has given you so many professional record options, and you're gonna get beautiful quality with all of those. I also wish they threw in just a nice, efficient H.265 10-bit record option for those times where you're doing like live music and sporting events and you want really long record times. With these very big file sizes, that can be a problem with the Blackmagic. So yes, this is a 6K camera, but it's really important to know that you're only gonna be able to record 6K when you're shooting in the B-RAW format. If you're in ProRes, you're capped up at 4K recording. Now that is oversampled, so it's using all the resolution of that 6K sensor to create the 4K image, but if you wanna record full 6K, yes, you're gonna be stuck with B-RAW for that. And in any of these record modes, the picture quality is absolutely beautiful coming off of this camera. Really nice color straight out. This is using their G5 color science, excellent dynamic range on it. However, there is one major drawback, and that is the rolling shutter on this is brutal. We're looking at 20 milliseconds to read out the whole sensor. So if you're shooting 6K or the oversampled 4K, anytime you move the camera, you're gonna get that gross jello-y kind of effect. And that's exacerbated by the fact that this has no in-body image stabilization. So I would definitely, if possible, use stabilized lenses if you're hand holding this, but you're still gonna run into those problems with the jello. It is the biggest drawback of this camera. And if you look at a lot of the mirrorless options around this same price, some of those are reading out twice as fast. One of the reasons this is a really exciting camera is the price. And this is a 2000 US dollar cinema camera that can record internal raw video, just an extra $500 to get an electronic viewfinder for that. Now, I'm not gonna compare it to some of the other like Z cams and things like that because I haven't tested them. But what we have recently tested are some very interesting hybrid mirrorless cameras around this price point. I've looked at those extensively and let's see how this camera compares. Let's start with the Panasonic GH6, which is a camera I absolutely love. Now, while it does have a smaller sensor, it does give you some real advantages over the 6K G2, starting with in-body image stabilization. We can record 4K 120p without a crop in that. And the EVF is the same resolution as the optional one with Blackmagic, which costs you an extra $500. However, if you are using DaVinci and you want raw video, you're out of luck because the only option for raw video on the GH6 is external ProRes RAW to an Atomos. I really hope they give you B-RAW support externally in the future. But again, you get that internally with the 6K camera. If you're a DaVinci user, that alone might tip you over that way. But what if you're looking for something with a similar sensor size? Well, then I would definitely compare the Blackmagic to the Fujifilm X-H2S. 
it does have some real advantages. There you're getting open gate three by two recording. It also has in-body image stabilization and fairly reliable video autofocus. Also, if you are a DaVinci Resolve user, you can externally output to a Blackmagic Video Assist that B-RAW option. So you do get some RAW support there. However, it's still way more convenient to record B-RAW right internally to the camera like we can with the Blackmagic. And remember, the Blackmagic has that big, beautiful 1080p display, better focus assist and exposure assist tools. It's kind of a wash. For run and gun, I'd go Fujifilm. If it's more cinema production, then the Blackmagic might be the better option. So after a few weeks, what are my final impressions of using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K G2? Well, it's a little bit mixed. In some regards, like the image quality, I just love what I'm getting out of this camera. And they have made real efforts to improve the usability with like that optional electronic viewfinder. Having a tilt screen on this makes a really big difference. But for most people, I think it's gonna be worth the extra $500 to move up to the 6K Pro and get internal ND filters. It's a huge time saver and really makes that camera a much more compelling option. But since the original Pocket 6K came out, we've seen real advancements in terms of what hybrid cameras are capable of doing. And I feel like there's a lot of recycled components in these cameras, and I think they need to just move to some new ones. Ditch the CFast card, get a mirrorless lens mount on this, and a much faster reading out sensor. That would go a long ways to making this very compelling. I would primarily look at these cameras if you plan to edit raw video within DaVinci Resolve. If that's the case, there's really nothing that matches the ease of use of raw video at this price point. Otherwise though, I think you'll be better served by a hybrid mirrorless camera. Lastly, and I think I speak for all of us here, it is time for Blackmagic to just completely redo how they name their cameras. Something far less convoluted would make my job much easier and this video actually much shorter. Thank you so much for watching this review. Hopefully it helped you out. Let me know in the comments below what you think of Blackmagic's other cameras. Don't forget to subscribe, check out like our things that are downstairs, the twits and the instas there, and I will see you again soon for more DP Review TV.